Right. The dot product, the significance of the dot product in three dimensions, actually it is given by the following observation. You know this observation. Probably you haven't really realized how significant that observation is, but you know that observation. In three dimensions, if you have two vectors in three dimensions, let me just zoom it in a little bit. If you have two vectors in three dimensions like this, there is an alternative way to compute the dot product. There is one, of course, when you do the components of the vectors, you multiply them one with, each, with another and add them up. That's one way to compute the dot product. There is another way in three dimensions. It exists only in three dimensions, or two dimensions, three dimensions, one dimension. It, it's the one which I normally call the geometrical way of computing the dot product. What, is it, what does it say? It says that the dot product can also be computed like this. Like this. You multiply the magnitudes or the lengths of the vectors and also multiply them with the angle here. The angle in between. This is the angle theta. This is a Greek letter theta, if you don't know it. This is a thing which we know from the three dimensions, and that's a very important thing. The reason why this is so, just a week ago, one student raised this question in tutorial I was, uh, I had, I had. And it's, it's, not an, it's not a trivial reason. Why exactly this right-hand side, why exactly this right-hand side is, ex is equal to the other right-hand side, the one which was on the previous slide, the one where it was A1 times B1 plus A2 times B2 plus A3 times B3. The identity between these two numbers, after all, these are just two numbers. This identity, it's a fundamental result of the three-dimensional geometry. It's not an easy proof, I think. Although, I think Wikipedia has that proof. So if you're interested, you can go and check that. Now, the reason I brought this up is this. In n dimensions, strictly speaking, we don't have any angles. But we can introduce them with the help of the dot product. By assuming, by making this assumption that something like this is also true in n, we, can, we, we can't prove this anymore because we don't have an angle in n dimension. But what we do, we, just, we do what we did before. We just try to extrapolate our experience with the three dimensions to n dimensions. And we say that, let's just assume that in n dimensions, we also have something like this. And if we do, then this will let me to define the angle between the vectors in n dimensions. If I solve here for cos, if I solve here for cos, that will let me find the angles in n dimensions via this identity. We can't prove this in n dimensions. This idea. Remember this. We can prove it in three dimensions, but in n dimensions, it's, it's our, I don't know, belief that what we experience in three dimensions should, probably, should also probably be true in n dimensions. So if I do that, so if I have my vectors in n dimensions now, two of them again, but now n dimensional, columns of numbers, I can, in principle, say that the angle between these two vectors will be set like this. The inverse of the dot product computed via components divided by the product of the lengths computed by the components. However, there is a big problem with this approach. Who sees the problem? There is a problem with this approach. Something. What about the inverse cos? It's, it's a function which cannot be computed all the time. There are some restrictions on the values which, which you can plug into the inverse cos. What are the restrictions? Yes, please. Doing minus one plus one. Perfect. In order to compute the inverse cos, you have to make sure that the number which you plug in, the number which you plug in, let me call this number x0, just for the brevity, for brevity. If I call this number x0, before I will be able to plug this number into my inverse cos, I have to make sure that this number is like this. Oops, sorry. I have to make sure this number is like this. If it's not so, no matter what I do, the inverse cos will not return a number. I can actually alter this a little bit. This is the same as to say that this number is like this, in absolute value less than 1, which is a more conventional way to write this. Now the question to you, why this is so? In three dimensions, we didn't have such a problems because this was proven. In three dimensions, this cos was the cos of the actual angle. It was between negative 1 and 1. And so when you solve for it, this fraction in three dimensions, it is negative 1 and 1, between negative 1 and 1, because it's a content of this proof. In n dimensions, we no longer have that privilege. So we have to see this some other way. And this some other way, it's very fundamental result in the n-dimensional linear algebra, which is called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. 
And that's something we're going to discuss with you next. I'll say it, uh, I'll call it theorem. And the theorem says that the absolute value, the absolute value of the dot product of two vectors in any dimensions never, never ever exceeds the product of the individual lengths of those vectors. If you believe in this inequality, then this x naught sitting here, it will be like this. And then I'm good to go with my definition of the angle. But before we can do that, of course, we have to establish that identity. That's a very important identity. It has lots of implications. And plus, the proof of that inequality is really, you know, it's a beauty. It's a true beauty. So we're going to look into that. Uh, and that's why, actually, the significance of this identity, sorry, I said identity, I mean inequality. The significance of this inequality also uh, emphasized by the fact that we have a name for that. It's called the cauchy schwarz inequality. So two mathematicians. Cauchy is a French mathematician. Schwartz, I can, you can guess it's a German mathematician. Oh. The suggestion goes like this. Let's just take the function like this. Look at this function. f of t equal something like this. If you look carefully, what we look in the, in, if you look carefully at the right hand side here, I have the a vector uh, subtract the scaled vector b with some value with some number t, and I take the length of that, and I take the square of that. It will be a function, right? The right-hand side, no matter what, it will return a number, some positive, in fact, number. Now, I'm going to modify this function a little bit. Look what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to remember the fact that the square of the length, it's a dot product of the vector with itself, right? Vector, dot product with itself. It's something we just discovered on the slide before. Now, the next natural step will be, of course, expanding this. Remember, that's the reason I listed the properties for you. We can expand dot product the way we expand multiplication of regular numbers. So if I do my expansion, here's the result of the expansion is a dot product with the a. Here it is. Then goes a dot product with this tb. And then goes tb, this tb, with this a. It's a regular expansion, like with numbers. And then goes tb dot product with tb. Again, referring to the properties of my dot product, I can, of course, take this scalar and put it in front of the dot product. I can take this scalar, and I can take this scalar, put it in front of the dot product. I can also observe, I can also observe that the a dot product with itself, it's the length of the vector a, square. And here will be b dot product with b. It will be length of b, square. If I make all of these observations, if I combine them in one step, the resulting formula or identity, it will be like this. Square of the length of A, which stands for this piece, then goes double of T and A dot product with B. It, this is for this piece and this for this piece together. They are identical. And then T square and the length of B square. Good. Now, what I will do now, I'll just put it up a little bit, like this. And I ask you this. Remember, we introduced this function in a pure vector, in a, in a pure vector form. We just took vector a, subtracted tb, found the length, and square it. But now when you look at this expression, the expression will come up like this. When you look at this expression, this seems to be like a regular, regular what? Parabola. parabola. Yeah, it is. It is a parabola. That's the highest coefficient of my parabola. It's a number. This whole thing is just a number, positive number, by the way. This is another number. This is another number. I can try to picture that parabola, right? Where, do, where, uh, where will the branches of that parabola go, up or down? Up, because the highest coefficient is positive. Here's my parabola. Let's just look into that parabola like this. So any function like this, that's a square polynomial. We all know that. Uh, Every function like this has a graph as a parabola. When the highest coefficient positive, branches will go up. I, if you look at my picture, you will see that I put my parabola entirely in the upper half plane. I didn't make parabola crossing the line. Do you know why I did so? Was it that is it an accident or that's intentional in, intentional step? My function, my first. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very correct observation. The, the first way I defined my function was the length of the vector. Length never goes negative. It hardly goes zero. So 
my function, which when it's defined like this, it's clear clear indication that my function is always positive or at, le at most zero. This way it is a parabola, of course, but this way it's a positive one. So my picture of the parabola above the horizontal axis, it's not the, it's not an accident. It is the reflection of this observation, right? Now, the minimal point of my parabola, this vertex, we know how to find the components of this vertex, right? Yeah, we know how to find the components. Uh, I mean, I don't need the components of the vertex, all of them. I need only the x component of this vertex. We all know from the elementary algebra that the point x0, which will correspond to the, to the vertex of my parabola, will be found like this. If you, if you take my a, b, and c from this expression for the parabola, if you take those, if you plug it in here, b will be, look at this, B will be A times B dot product and 2 with negative. Little a will be the length of this B. The value of this little t, which will correspond to the vertex of my parabola, here it is. Here it is. This is a vertex of my parabola. I just follow this formula from the our elementary knowledge of the parabolas and quadratic polynomials. Now, if I use this value, and if I put this value into my function, in my, if I want to find the height of my vertex, the actual y component of my vertex, I need to take this point t naught, and I have to plug it into my function. Here's the result of this step. If I compute my f of t naught, look what happens. Well, when I put t naught in here, well, I have to square it. If I put it in here, well, I don't have to put it in here. And I'll do some arithmetic, which I will probably leave. I will leave it out. If I do this arithmetic, the result, you see I put the dots here to say I just some of the steps of the, some of the arithmetic steps are left unexplained. I, I hope you can recover those steps without my help. If I do that, the result of this will be something like this. And we know that this expression is non-negative, to be correct, non-negative. Now, if you compare this inequality, if you compare this inequality, and if you compare this inequality, the one which we needed to prove, you can see that one is basically equivalent to the other. All you have to do, you have to take this term on the right-hand side and multiply everything by the denominator here and take a square root, of course. And that's how the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is proved. It's one of the ways to prove that Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So if you actually, I just I put this here in writing for you. If you take this piece on the right hand side here and you multiply everything by the denominator value like this, the result will be this one. Square of the dot product from the enumerator here and product of the lengths to the square. The last step, the last step to connect this inequality with this one is the square root from the left hand side and from the right hand side. Any questions? Because this expression is never negative. It's the length of the vector. And this expression, I mean, if you put t naught in here, you mean you put t naught in here, isn't it? But still, this is, the, this is something which never goes negative. It, it can go zero in the exceptional circumstances. It can. And actually, it's a, sometimes these exceptional circumstances, they put as a complement to the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, when exactly Cauchy-Schwarz inequality becomes equality. In our proof here, it is clear it will happen when, when here we have zero, when we have equal sign in here, which means the length of this vector is zero, right? But the length of this vector is zero when vector A equal to the TB, which means A, in geometric terms, A is parallel to the vector B. And that's, like I said, it is a sometimes put next to the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and the statement goes like this. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality becomes equality, the exact equality, when one vector is scalar multiple of the other, or when one vector is parallel to the other. And the reason for that is very clear here. To make this exact zero, A must be equal to B. A must be scalar multiple of B. 